now it is my pleasure to introduce our next keynote conversation, Defending American Values in a Shifting World Order. America has long been a beacon of hope and individual freedom for people around the world who are looking for the promise of a better life. Sadly, today we are facing war and increasing tensions around the world. The challenges to freedom and to America's position on the world stage have arguably never been greater. As lawmakers debate how this country should protect itself and engage internationally, philanthropy has a critical role to play in informing policy both abroad and at home, improving our national security and foreign policy capabilities, supporting our troops and others serving abroad, and providing pathways to opportunity for refugees who arrive on our shores with nothing. This afternoon's keynote conversation will discuss all of these aspects of our nation's role in the world. First, we will welcome the 70th US Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, to say a few words, followed by a panel discussion. Prior to serving as Secretary of State, Secretary Pompeo served as a director of the Central Intelligence Agency and was elected to four terms in Congress representing Kansas's fourth district. He graduated first in his class at the United States Military Academy at West Point in 1986 and served as a cavalry officer patrolling the Iron Curtain. He rose to the rank of captain and went on to graduate from Harvard Law School. Before serving in Congress, he spent a decade leading two manufacturing businesses in South Central Kansas. From West Germany during the Cold War to a machine shop floor in Kansas to most recently leading the CIA and the Department of State, that is quite a journey. Welcome, Mr. Secretary. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. It's great to be here. Uh, you, you, you left off the fact that I taught fifth grade Sunday school, <laughs> which, is what, which was the best training for being America's Secretary of State. <laughs> because if you can keep fifth grade boys in their seat, you can, Vladimir Putin is piece cake. <laughs> uh, I thought I'd spend uh, the, the minutes that I have with you this afternoon uh, I'm talking about something that I, I don't spend as much time talking about these days, but was very important to, to me and I think to our country as well uh, in both of my roles in four years in the Trump administration. Um, if you tried to overlay uh, the notion that we put in, we, we focused on making sure we understood what the American people needed, how to make you more prosperous, more secure, and deliver without having to send our young boys and girls to fight in tough places. Uh, there were a couple of anchors to this uh, for me and for the project that I was engaged in on behalf of you and the president. Um, I put them in multiple buckets. It's an imperfect set of analogies that I'll, I'll bring to bear. But suffice it to say, we, we thought about sovereignty and its connectivity to religious freedom and basic fundamental rights for people all across the world. And I'll come back to that because that's where you all can have an enormous impact. Um, when I began my time as Secretary of State, I'd had this mission in my pocket for a long time. Uh, we had become, our, our foreign policy and our diplomats around the world had become unmoored from the things we knew made America special and unique. That we are in fact a force for good wherever we go in the world. Doesn't mean we don't get it wrong, we don't make mistakes, but suffice it to say that other nations, just, they, they love having us around. There's, there's a story, there was a, a, a senior African leader who said, you know Mike, we." Uh, we train with the Americans, our soldiers train with the Americans, and we come to love America. And then we train with the Russians, and we come to love America. Uh, I, I, think, I think that's fundamentally true. And so I created what became the Unalienable Rights Commission. None of you have heard of this. Uh, the New York Times and Washington Post panned it, made it lovely. Uh, it, it, it tried to re-anchor our understanding in the central founding principles of our nation. You can go read it, although it is hard to find since this State Department has now pulled it off the website. You can find it. It was led by a woman named Mary Ann Glendon, a Catholic lay leader who was one of my, uh, who was a, a professor at Harvard Law School who, for, who I was a research assistant for. Uh, and she grabbed people from uh, nearly every faith here in America, 
across a broad perspective, and, and 10 of them came together and said, what are the things that make America special, unique, and why do we matter uh, for our own people, for people all across the world? And I used that to send this out to my teams all across the world so that they would be thinking about this, uh, the central idea that religious freedom actually matters in the world. It makes a difference. Nations that are more free are much less likely to go to war with us and they're more likely to support the things that matter to the American people. So we worked tirelessly on that. I did it alongside so many of the folks in this room, great philanthropists, donors, charitable people. Um, I, I always made a point when I traveled uh, to go visit uh, religious institutions and private sector actors. As a Secretary of State, I'd loved having a big Navy, a powerful Army, a killer good Air Force, but what I always had in my pocket was American creativity, innovation, and the power of America's economy and our charitable nature around the world. We've done a lot of good. So I would travel to South America and go to a synagogue, and I'd be hosted by the people there that would talk about anti-Semitism in that place, and almost always I would have an American NGO, or an American private sector group who had been deeply supportive of both my trip there and the efforts that were being made in that place. I traveled to a really difficult part of northern Iraq where Christians were being persecuted and the American groups on the ground there, private sector groups working alongside the United States government to deliver really good outcomes for those people and for our country as well. We were making friends. When the virus struck, I don't know if Ken Griffin's here, I know he'll be with you. When the virus struck, uh, Ken showed up with a 757 to get Americans out of Wuhan, China, when there was no other solution, that we could not get a gray tail aircraft in American governmental aircraft into that place. We had a private sector actor step up uh, after I gave him a holler and said I needed some help. And at the peak of the pandemic, when we had no idea what was going on, when we returned all the Americans to March Air Force Base because we were afraid to bring them back into the country, it was a private sector actor who facilitated 14 of my diplomats and a couple of hundred Americans who were trapped in Hubei province at an incredibly difficult time. Hand in hand, working alongside the State Department it was my team on the plane, it was my doctors on the plane to try and take care of the health of these people, but it was the private sector that actually enabled us to deliver this. Charitable contribution, it wasn't even mentioned in the moment, there was no benefit, but it was wonderful and decent and lovely and saved American lives, I am convinced of that. Uh, we had a second notion too. Uh, second notion was sovereignty matters. We've built this world, uh, trade, commerce, all the economic prosperity that's flowed to our country on the central thesis that nation states matter, sovereignty matters. Uh, we defended that everywhere we could. We defended it here at home at our southern border. Uh, we defended it for the rightful homeland of the Jewish people in Israel. We made big gains. Everyone remembers the move of the embassy. But one should not forget, we made deep statements about the Israel's true nature. It's right to the Golan Heights, the decency of Jews settling in Judea and Samaria. We did such good work, there's now a wine named after me, Pompeo wine, you should check it out, it's not bad. <laughs> we, we worked on sovereignty for the people of Taiwan, understanding that the claims that Xi Jinping is making, the, a dictator who denies religious freedom, who is holding a million Muslims and things that look and feel much like internment camps that we know from the worst of times in the 1930s, who says that Taiwan is part of China and should simply be reunified. We supported the Taiwanese people in their decency and their rightfulness to their democracy. And you know the private sector, there are private sector groups working to support the Taiwanese people to strengthen their democratic institutions, their judiciary, the rule of law, all of the things that build sovereign nations and will provide the Taiwanese people with their freedom are certainly part of what America and its government must do, but there's so much good work. Uh, we did this for the people of Ukraine as well. I spent a fair amount of time in southern Ukraine when I was the CIA director. And while I cannot tell you all the work we did, you should know that at least part of their success should be attributed to you. American work. The CIA was there, the Department of Defense was there, that were the, but there were private sector entities too, providing training, support, democracy, uh, additions, all kinds of tools helping the Ukrainian people protect themselves. We didn't anticipate what, would, what has happened since February of this year, but leave no doubt, the United States government and the American private sector has made an enormous difference in the capacity of the brave Ukrainians to protect their own sovereignty over these past months, and I am confident we'll continue to do so, providing help and assistance and succor to the refugees, 
um, but also providing them with the moral clarity about their right to control their own sovereign nation. I'll, I'll close with this thought. Uh, when I was the CI director, um, there were a whole bunch of private sector folks who helped me. In fact, there may even be a couple in this room. I will not tell you which of you it is. They came around to try and help uh, the men who worked for me, who were in very difficult places, who had difficulty with their families back home and who were struggling. And much like we do for Veterans Group, there were private sector actors who said, let me help your folks. You know, it's really hard if you're a CA officer in a clandestine role and you need counseling because you're having trouble in your family or you're, you've got an addiction problem and you, you, you go to your counselor and the first thing the counselor will say, well, what do you do for a living? We, we built out a chaplain's program. We built out a counseling set of centers all around the world and we provided support to these brave young men and women who are delivering on your behalf each and every day. I couldn't have done it with taxpayer money. I couldn't have done it with congressional appropriations. It took philanthropists, generous Americans, who said, uh, I, I can't do this myself, but I want to provide assistance to you, Mr. Director. I wanted to use that as my ending thought because I wanted to thank you all for that. All of the help, all of the provision of resources that you have done to help me in my role, I deeply appreciate. Thank you, bless you for that, and I look forward to the rest of our conversation today as well. Thank you. You want me to start here? Thank you so much, Secretary Pompeo, for those compelling remarks uh, on America's role in the world. And I'm delighted to turn the panel discussion over to our moderator, Aaron McLean. Aaron is a senior director at the Paul E. Singer Foundation, a U.S. Marine veteran, and a senior fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. Now I'd like to welcome Aaron to the stage to lead our discussion and introduce his fellow panelists. Very nice. Thank you, Elise, for that kind introduction. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for those uh, fantastic remarks. I'm gonna introduce the other members of our panel today. We have Jim Hake with us. Jim began his career as a successful entrepreneur. After the 9-11 attacks, he founded Spirit of America, which is the only nonprofit recognized by Congress and approved by the Department of Defense to work alongside deployed troops and provide assistance in support of their missions. We are also welcoming today Luma Mufle. Uh, Luma also has a background as an entrepreneur. She is the daughter and granddaughter of Syrian refugees, came to the United States for her education, was ultimately granted political asylum here. In 2006, Luma founded Fuji's Family, the only network of schools devoted to refugee and immigrant education. In addition to any number of other impressive affiliations, uh, Luma has been a Manhattan Institute Civil Society Fellow. So thank you all for, uh, for taking the time to do this today. Uh, Mr. Secretary, our, our task is to um, tease out some of the connections between foreign policy and philanthropy, but I, I do wanna start with a, a straight policy question for you, because it's an urgent issue. I think it's on a lot of people's minds. You have spoken eloquently um, about the stakes in the war right now in Ukraine. Um, earlier in the conflict, you described the situation as one in which um, the, the question on the table was, is the Russian empire going to be reconstituted? And you made the case that the reconstitution of that empire would be a terrible thing for American interests. In the months since, it seems the pendulum has swung a little bit. Ukraine has a bit of wind at its back, and I think we are all grateful for that. But there are those who suggest that because the wind is at Ukraine's back, because the stakes are no longer necessarily the reconstitution of the Russian Empire, but rather whether or not Vladimir Putin gets to keep anything he took in the first place, whether or not he gets to stay in power, that we need to exercise some caution, that we're entering a dangerous period where the risk of escalation is real. So the question for you, sir, is what, you know, what's your take on that generally, and, and how do you see this resolving itself? Uh, well, thanks. And by the way, go Army. Gotta give, them, gotta give them Marine a hard time. Uh, I've got help to my left here, yeah. it's all good. Um, you know, a, a couple thoughts. First, I, I wouldn't be, your, the, your question had as a predicate an enormous confidence that the Ukrainian successes will continue. I, I would not take that for granted. Um, I, would, I would also say it is much more complicated than, than we're seeing. The Ukrainian successes are real, powerful, important, but this is, not, this is not a foreordained conclusion that what we're deciding about is how much real estate Vladimir Putin will get to keep. 
Uh, the, the army, his army failed him, his air force failed him, his cyber team has failed him, there's no doubt about that. But do not underestimate the capacity of that nation to reconstitute, rebuild, and Vladimir Putin's personal determination to create whatever one wants to call it, greater Russia, uh, not just in Ukraine, but other places as well. Were he to, while we're sitting here in this room today, were he to lay down his arms and declare a ceasefire, he's just regrouping. He believes this in his heart that he is entitled to this. Uh, I, I've spent a fair amount of time with him. We would, we would talk about this, and, and he would say, Mike, you're, you're from Kansas, right? I'd say, yeah. And he said, you, th you think Kansas is part of the United States? I'd say, yeah, I do. And he'd say, explain that. And what he was conveying was, in the same way I think Kansas is part of America, he believes that Ukraine and the Baltics are part of Russia. So just know he is determined, and those around him are equally determined. Uh, there's always risk of escalation. I, I worry about that, but I think we have worried about that far too much. The notion was we don't want to provoke Vladimir Putin. I would argue he has done been provoked. Uh, and, and the real risk, it seems to me, of escalation is time. The, 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 the weaker our response, the more tepid, the more piecemeal our response, the more time Vladimir Putin has to contemplate really bad things, like potentially a tactical nuclear weapon or other tools in his toolkit. We should provide crushing power in the same way we've provided. It's not about sending U.S. men and women. It's about providing the tools Zelensky is asking for and shorten the decision-making time frame for Vladimir Putin. That, would, that creates the least risk to the Ukrainians, to greater Europe, and to the United States of America as well. And so uh, we should remain determined. I hope the Europeans will not lose heart and lose their way. It is going to be a very difficult winter in Europe. Uh, natural gas will be in short supply, and it will be really expensive. And so the task for uh, America is to keep the European cohort together to provide the tools the Ukrainians need and to continue to push Vladimir Putin towards uh, something that looks like a resolution that the whole world can live with. Sticking with fundamental principles for a moment, um, in your remarks you referenced Ukraine, Taiwan, Israel. Um, you've referred to these places as lighthouses of, of liberty. Um, and suggested that it is fundamentally in the American interest to support these places in one fashion or another. Um, uh, as you were aware, there's a counter argument out there uh, in the land. Um, uh, the people who make this argument describe themselves as restrainers. They sometimes call themselves realists. I'm not sure any of those words are actually fairly applied. Um, but what is in it for, um, as you've said, for the machinist in Kansas, for the yeah. service employee in Florida, <laughs> um, that Taiwan remain free, that Israel remain safe, um, that you recant, Ukraine retain its sovereignty. Yeah, I, I consider myself a realist, <laughs> and we were pretty restrained, and we still delivered deterrence <laughs> in spite of being each of those things. Often they're considered, right, they're mutually exclusive ideas. They're not remotely mutually exclusive. We, we use the important economic tools like our energy sector <laughs> and the American private sector to deliver uh, friends and uh, thwart our adversaries. Uh, it matters a lot. If you, uh, uh, what's, I, I could go on for a long time about why it matters to America, but I just try to give concrete examples. Uh, I like to give ones that are close to home. So uh, a significant piece of the red winter wheat in the world is grown in my home state of Kansas. Farmers in Kansas are gonna make good money this year. The red winter wheat prices are very, very high. Uh, next year, they won't be able to afford fertilizer to put it in their fields. This is a direct result of failed American policy. We didn't deter Vladimir Putin and now the other place that makes a lot of red winter wheat, the bread basket that extends through Ukraine and part of Russia, uh, will have difficulty either growing or getting to market in the next season. Um, there are moral reasons, there are all kinds of important democratic reasons that is, but if you just wanna to get to the brass tacks of why does some family uh, suffer, uh, we're all gonna have energy prices that are higher. Uh, Europeans will be riding in the streets. I read that in France there are already protests. Uh, we'll be riding in the streets this winter. I'm confident of that because uh, they won't be able to heat their homes at a price that they can afford. When their companies shut down, think of Siemens or BASF, big, big facilities that feed America. If those manufacturing facilities are shut down in Germany for a week or two because there's no natural gas this winter, there will be furloughs and layoffs in the United States in the tens of thousands because they feed the BMW plant in Alabama and the Mercedes facility in South Carolina and the uh, Ford auto plant in Kansas City uh, and every chemical plant in America from BASF. It, what happens in Kyiv and Beijing actually matters in places like Wichita, Kansas today. And 
I hope leaders will make that case. There are many in my party who have taken a fundamentally different view of how we ought to participate in the world, but we're it. We are, we are this bastion. It is our responsibility, and it is not just our responsibility because we want to be the global policeman or the leader of the world. It is our responsibility to the American people to make sure we get this right. Thank you. Uh, Jim, uh, you, you're back from Ukraine uh, just this week, if I'm not mistaken. What are you seeing on the ground there, and what role is your organization, Spirit of America, playing? Well, I think what the Secretary just said is exactly right. And you have to start with what's at stake in Ukraine. And it's not only about Ukraine. Uh, what's at stake, there, there's a, a war raging in the world today. Uh, it's a war of values and ideas. And uh, America's idea is liberty. America's idea is the promise of a free and better life. We face adversaries, and the Secretary named a few. Uh, Russia, China, Iran, the Islamic State, they're all still out there. And what they represent is the exact opposite of what America stands for. And what we're seeing is that they're working to fight against our values every day all around the world. And Ukraine is the most visible example of it. So Ukraine is on the front lines of that war of values and the front lines of the defense of the free world. So that's what's going on in Ukraine. It's not just about Ukrainians. Uh, is a, an important thing to say. So I'm just back. I um, uh, you know, uh, arrived back in the States on Monday night from Kyiv through Poland. And there are a couple of things. The Ukrainians have dealt with unimaginable tragedy uh, since this war began. And not just since this war began. Russia invaded Ukraine for the first, well, first time in recent times in 2014. Right, so they invaded Ukraine in 2014. There's this technical expression, they annexed Crimea, which sounds like you, know, you build a, a new addition on your house or something. They invaded it, they took it over. They invaded the eastern part of the country. There were two separate ceasefire agreements never honored by Russia as they, built, as, as they bought more time to continue their attacks, which we've now seen in, in February of this year. So uh, what Spirit of America is doing, I have to say a little bit about what we do because it's we're pretty unconventional nonprofit. We're privately funded nonprofit. So what I'm explaining is not done with any government funding at all. Uh, in Ukraine, we started in 2014 and 2015 to support the Ukrainian Armed Forces, working with the then Ambassador Jeff Pyatt. And uh, Jeff, Ambassador Pyatt's guidance went to us, because we work alongside troops and diplomats all over the world. His guidance to us was help the Ukrainian Armed Forces, number one. And number two, if you can do something to combat Russian propaganda, do that too. So what we ended up doing was working with a couple of Ukrainians to start up Ukraine's first armed forces media property. It's called Army FM to meet the information needs of Ukrainian soldiers fighting on the front lines. And it's still operational eight years later. Uh, and it's the most popular radio station in Ukraine right now. We got it started, but it was picked up with government funding after we proved the concept. So we started then, but what we've done since the war began is provided over 200 tons of what's referred to as non-lethal assistance which is kind of a bad expression because the only word people tend to hear is lethal, uh, but it's non-lethal. It's protective aid for Ukrainian soldiers defending the country, defending their democracy on the front line. So things like ballistic helmets, uh, body armor, first aid kits, vehicles, all things to fill the gaps between what the US government is doing, which are mostly weapons, um, and, and what's actually needed to help Ukraine win the fight. We're also doing some things of a humanitarian nature, uh, but the, the main effort is to help Ukraine win. Got it. And so I think folks in the room will understand how philanthropy can support the Ukrainians in the Ukrainian military. They obviously have very significant needs. The United States military is a, compared to the Ukrainians, compared to any military, very powerful, sufficient force. Um, what is the role of philanthropy working alongside the military as you do specifically? Well, it's, it's really interesting. And I'd say, I think for a lot of philanthropists, it's kind of, uh, it's not intuitive. And so we're all familiar, everyone here is familiar with the, that there are gaps in public education and a role for philanthropy, gaps in healthcare, gaps in pretty much every sector of society and a role for private philanthropy. Well, the, the thing is, and we all accept that, um, you know, a government only solution is not the best America can do. So the th thing that is a little bit surprising to folks is in this national security domain, there are gaps too. And one of the reasons there are gaps is that you know, we, we put our, we put 1% of America, our troops and our diplomats, to deal with winning this war of values. 1%. 99% of America pretty much on the bench. You know, people do things on an individual basis, but as a nation, 99% of the country is on the bench. So what that creates are these really big gaps when it comes to 
defending and spreading America's values around the world. Nothing we do as Spirit of America ends up in the hands of the US military. We're doing things to help affect local situations by supporting partner forces, by supporting the, the kind of uh, free and independent media. Uh, one of our big efforts in addition to Ukraine is in Taiwan right now, where we're building a network of civil society organizations that are trained and equipped to respond to a crisis. And that is a key part of Taiwan's, uh, if you're familiar with the expression, porcupine strategy. Uh, so to help deter a uh, Chinese invasion. But if there is a Chinese invasion, the, the same capability will help Taiwan defend its democracy. Luma, you have a, a fascinating personal story. Um, and you sort of represent, as it were, the, the domestic side of these issues. If Jim and the Secretary has work and focused abroad of late, um, you work with refugees here in America. Um, tell us about how Fuji's family got started. How did you um, get into the business of independent schools focusing on refugees? I mean, it's a very unlikely story. Um, so as you mentioned, yeah, my mom's family fled Syria during the first Assad regime back in the 60s. I was born and raised in Jordan, uh, came here at 18, and applied for political asylum uh, my senior year of college. I'm gay. I can get the death penalty in Jordan. Um, and so this country gave me my life. Um, I really struggled after college trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, and one day, um, on a drive to one of the suburbs right outside of Atlanta, I missed my turn uh, coming back home, and I saw a group of kids playing soccer. Um, they were outside with rocks set up as goals, playing barefoot, um, and having the time of their life. And it reminded me of Jordan, the way I grew up playing soccer in the streets with my brothers and cousins. Um, I'd been a volunteer coach for a while. I had a soccer ball in my car. I got out. The boys rushed me. They wanted the ball. I wanted to play. Immigrants haggle. We <laughs> haggled. Um, and they reluctantly let me join their game. They gave me the short kid and the chubby one. Um, but we had the time of our life. Um, my original group of uh, boys were from Afghanistan, South Sudan, and Liberia. Um, and that ball, ball united us. Uh, we slowly started uh, finding out stuff about each other, where we're from, um, our commonalities, um, and I ended up forming a soccer team. And that was my intent. I was going to coach soccer. We're going to win some championships, because um, I know how to do that. Um, but after practice, some of my players would say, hey, coach, can you help us with our homework? And initially, I was dismissive. I was like, go get your parents to help you or your siblings. Um, not realizing that their parents were illiterate, not only in English, but in their um, native uh, tongue. Um, and so I'd start helping them. And I remember this one moment, I was helping this one player, he'd been in the country about four years, um, could speak English, um, and he, he was working on his homework, and he's like, Coach, I have a headache, can you read to me? I was like, sure. He didn't cause any trouble. Um, my players have to turn in their report cards to play, gotten A's and B's. Um, so I read to him and filled out his worksheet. Second day, he had a headache. Same thing. Third day, he had a headache. I was like, all right, something's up. He doesn't have a headache at practice. Um, what's going on here? And I said, Lewis, I have a headache. And he's like, no, I have a headache. Luckily, I'm more stubborn. And what felt like five minutes, uh, he finally looked up at me and said, um, coach, I can't read. And that broke me. Um, because I believe, um, like, how can you be in the school for three years and not be able to read? Um, my parents sent me to British and American schools, in case you're wondering about my accent, um, because they believed that was the best the world had to offer. And I thought every school in America was like the State Department run school I went to as a kid in Amman, Jordan. And I was shaken to my core that it wasn't. Um, but the wonderful thing about America is, if there's a problem, you can find a solution. And so I did what I feel any coach would have done. Um, if your players aren't being taught or their needs aren't being met, what do you do? You start your own school. <laughs> and so I started school, six kids, one teacher in a church basement, grew. It was 100% philanthropy. Um, and um, in 2018, we opened another school in Columbus, Ohio, under their voucher program. And in 2020, we converted our um, Georgia school to a charter so we could get more sustainable funding. 
Um, and this year we partnered with the school district in Bowling Green, Kentucky to implement our model into their district. Um, so. And if you only had a superficial sort of understanding of, of your work, you know, knowing that you're sort of bringing refugee um, children together into schools, yeah. um, there might be some concern about further isolation or further kind of balkanization. Obviously, you are, you're heavily focused on integration and integrating these kids into American society. What are the challenges that you face and, and how do you overcome those challenges? Um, we do segregate, like our model segregates for a period of time, right? So we wanna get you ready, we wanna mainstream you back in, we wanna make sure we're leveling the playing field. Um, it's English only in our school. We have over 30 dialects. You can't do any other type um, of approach. And so we celebrate our kids' cultures, their identity. Um, we see where they could come from as an asset. Um, and at the same time, we're teaching them about America. Like from simple, like our team right now is planning Halloween and trick-or-treating. Um, and if you look at it from the lens of someone who's never celebrated Halloween, um, I remember a few years ago, we took one of our Afghan students, his first trick-or-treating. He had just come to the school like a couple of weeks before. He comes downstairs, sees everybody painting their faces, and he's like, what's going on? I'm like, oh, we're going to Halloween. And he's like, what's Halloween? And I'm like, oh, here. Like, I haven't explained it. I'm like, well, we're going to dress up, and we're going to knock on doors. We're going to get candy. Um, <laughs> and he's like, what? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and so we went out, and we dressed up. We went knocking on doors, explained, you know, if the porch light was on, what do you do? Came back with a ton of candy. Um, and then he's like, coach, what time tomorrow? And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know? um, and you know, he wanted to know why we're not going trick-or-treating every single day. Right? <laughs> and I think uh, refugees also show us what's the best of America. You know, like I was speaking to someone a little earlier, and I said, here, I saw a problem, and I could fix it. Right? But if you grew up in a restrictive culture, you can't even think about fixing something or doing something outside the box or having philanthropy solve problems that government can't. Um, but here you can. And I think because I left my birth country, I understand everything this country has, um, the freedoms it gives all of us, and I'll never take it for granted. And every day I see that in my students. So a theme here in all the... A theme here in all these responses is, is the belief that all of you have that America is fundamentally a force for good. Um, it's a source of opportunity, of, of freedom, and, and, and so forth. Mr. Secretary, um, you're a veteran, um, the Army. Uh, you have been outspoken um, in recent months about some problems that our military faces um, that stem from Washington, D.C., sort of cultural issues that go under the banner of, of dare I say, wokeness. Um, what should folks in this room know about what you're seeing in the military? Should they be concerned? This is a, a project that is uh, personal for me uh, and important to all of us. Uh, our, and and it, by the way, not, not remotely political in my judgment, although some would argue that it is. Um, it's about mission focus. Uh, our, the young people who go to the recruiting station and raise their right hand and say, I want to be a Marine or a, a, a sailor, uh, do that because they, they want to go be trained and prepared to fight America's war, to deter our adversaries. They don't want to be focused on things that are extraneous to this. And this is the, the risk. It, you can call it wokeness. I, I've used that term. It's an imperfect description of what's taking place. What's happening is uh, the senior leaders, both civilian and military, inside of our Department of Defense are seeing external pressures to drive them off the mission focus. Uh, what's the mission focus, right? It is to pre prepare to defend and deter our fights, to train and equip to do that, uh, and then finally, uh, to make sure that there's a level of excellence that rewards merit as defined in a way that is very precise, and they are walking away from that. And when you begin to prioritize other things separate from that, today it's diversity, equity, and inclusion. They are, they are teaching things about our nation's history that are inconsistent with a basic understanding of our founding, right? The, the greatness of our founding with all the challenges we face, there, there is no nation in the history of civilization with that, that set of understanding. When you begin to walk away from that inside, 
what has proven to be a historically culturally important institution, wholly apart from its capability to fight and win our wars. Uh, it's been a place for Americans to be socially mobile and socially upward. It certainly was that for me. It gave me enormous amount of opportunities. Uh, I worry about it a great deal. And I think our military is beginning to walk away from that. And I think you're seeing, I think you're seeing that play out, not only in our readiness issues, but you've all seen the reporting that uh, military failed in its recruitment goals for the last handful of months by a very significant amount. Uh, the Biden administration attributed to uh, uh, fat, lazy kids. Uh, their words, not mine. Uh, I think it's in part because the reason that you, you, you don't go to the recruiting station because you're looking for a safe space, right? You, 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 go, you go to a recruiting station because you have this noble idea that you're going to do good and you think this is a place you can make it and it can give you opportunity you might not have any place else. Uh, it's why I went uh, and so many others do. And when they begin to focus on Climate change, right? President, President Biden has said, our military will be carbon neutral by 2035. Okay, <laughs> but I'd really like that aircraft to be able to shoot down a Russian, <laughs> right? Uh, and if, it, if there's no carbon coming out the back end, cool, but like, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's got to deliver on its, function, its, its core mission set. And that's, that's why I've been focused on this, spending a lot of time helping E4s, E5s, E6s, defend themselves against the tyranny that I think is beginning to emerge inside this really important institution. Taking us back. <laughs> Taking us back to this question of foreign policy and philanthropy. Um, you obviously addressed a number of ways in which philanthropy supports um, America's aims abroad in your remarks. Um, I wanna ask you to, to zoom in a bit on the question of, of policy research. You're affiliated with the Hudson Institute now. So you've seen policymaking as a very senior policymaker from Congress as well. Um, now you're affiliated with a very prominent Washington think tank, which has many supporters in the room. What role does philanthropy have to play in the policy conversation specifically in Washington? Oh, uh, it, it's a, it has enormous impact on all of us who are sitting at the fulcrum where you have to help a president make really hard decisions. Uh, I would read stuff from a broad range of uh, think tanks, uh, universities too, places where scholars gather to try and help solve some of the most challenging problems. Very few things get to the Secretary of State, let alone the President, unless they are, <laughs> there's no straight lines right. often. Uh, and so frankly, you have to be anchored in the value set <laughs> to be able to take the data that's presented to you and make a judgment that is consistent with delivering on behalf of America. and. Uh, a, a big group of think tanks are enormously helpful. So are our school systems. You should know uh, that there are big policy organizations on the progressive left trying to accomplish this same thing. There are, uh, and, and you will find this too, as our uh, administrations change, you'll be working in the field. You don't, you don't have to say this, I can. Um, I, I promise you there are easier times to work with uh, American diplomats and there are more difficult times to work with American diplomats because American people elect different leaders with a different set of priorities and a different set of understandings. Uh, and there are groups, philanthropists all across the country from uh, a space that has a value set different from mine, I'll speak just for myself, that are working hard to do exactly the same kind of policy in influence, right? Presenting facts and data. And so my, my urging is I actually welcome that. I think ideas from lots of places can prove valuable. Uh, what's really important is that the voices that, that share the understandings that you all gathered around on this uh, as part of this philanthropy roundtable are there as well in the policy making and the policy uh, analysis level and uh, lots of great groups to do that. I happen to be blessed to be one of them, but there are many. Sure. I, I, let me bring a version of this question just down the panel. Jim, you have a room here full of folks who care about America, who are interested in foreign policy. Beyond, of course, Spirit of America, what, what broad advice would you give them? How does philanthropy support foreign policy? Well, I, I think the, the biggest thing is, you know, without a, a understanding that 1% of our country, our troops and diplomats are tasked with fighting this war of values. And we have to have the best of America to win this war. We have to, it's, it's as existential as it gets. And the, the, uh, our freedoms, our way of life, our security are at stake. The challenging part for everyone here is these things happen far away. But when they, and it's good that they're happening far away. We wanna keep it that way, but we have to win that war of values. And so with just 1% of the country really engaged, I'd say you have to get in the game uh, because there is just too much at stake and the, the, the 
it, it's just an unfamiliar area. Like, well, you have troops, don't they have guns? We don't have, you know, well, I don't know if anyone's carrying a gun here today. Probably not. Uh, but, you know, it, so it's unfamiliar. But the same things when you think of it not as uh, fighting a war with weapons, but that it's a war of values, that's where the American people have so much to offer. And leaving it up to our government, it's just, it's just a, a part of us. So I would just say, you know, find a way to, uh, to get in the game and it will make a difference. There is an enormous, everything is at stake. If we don't win the war of values that's raging in the, war to, in the, in the world today, really nothing else matters. Uh, so yeah, get in the game, get off the bench. Luma, if you would, could you expand on something you said earlier in your remarks about America being the kind of place where we solve problems for ourselves, similar to what Jim just said. How does that impact you working in the education space? What's unique about, for example, doing what you're doing here versus trying to do it in some other country? I mean, I can't do it in any other country. You know, like where would I be able, like as a gay Muslim woman working with refugee kids to create and build an incredible education environment for those who people give up on, like nowhere. Like I've been to camps in, refugee camps in Jordan, in Turkey, in Greece. Like that's not an environment to learn. That's how those countries treat those who have fled their homes. The United States is different. We actually do give a second chance. Like you can rebuild yourself, you do the hard work, um, learn English. Um, I think what happened here is private philanthropy incubated an idea, saw it through for 10 years, and now we're figuring out how to scale it. We know it works with not a lot of restriction, right? Um, can it work in the charter space with the same results? You know, our students see two, two and a half years of academic gain per year, um, which is unheard of with all students, but it is definitely unheard of with multilingual students, right? So I think what we showed is what is possible. Instead of complaining about it, like, oh, there's no way this is gonna happen, or these are the issues these families are facing. It's like, no, how do you welcome people? How do you have a softer landing space? How do you bring parents in so they understand the American school system and what is expected, um, instead of pushing people away? Secretary Pompeo, I, I know I'm a few months early here, but I understand you have a book coming out. I don't actually see any press in the room. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure they've snuck in somewhere. <laughs> I, I don't want to pull a Connie Chung on you and say, you know, just between you and me, but um, I think I lost everyone under the age of 40 with that reference. Um, uh, any tidbits you want to share with the room? The oh, goodness. Uh, yeah, by the way, if we were in Kansas, everybody would be carrying a firearm. So. <laughs> Uh, the, 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 the book, you can order the book, it's out uh, in January if the printers can ever get it off the press. Supply chains are a mess everywhere, even in the publishing industry. Uh, the book is called Never Give an Inch, Fighting for the America I Love. And what it tries to do is just tell the history of what we tried to do for four years. It talks a lot about what we were talking about here today. It talks about grounding in American values and how the private sector can deliver that set of values for the American people. and. Uh, for the world and how diplomats and soldiers and all of th those of us with uh, responsibility for American security around the world are counting on America's innovators, creators, private sector, the freedoms that we have, the liberty that we have in America, our virtues and values set here in America uh, to present really good outcomes and how we tried for our four years uh, to use that to, to benefit the American people. Uh, and there's some good stories in there too. Um, we are short on time here. So Mr. Secretary, I'm gonna uh, take the last question to you. Um, you spoke about Israel in your remarks. Uh, you have a lot of supporters of the state of Israel in the room. Um, uh, you are um, an example of and a leader in this tremendous phenomenon of not only American support for Israel, but of Christian support for Israel. Talk a bit uh, about that phenomenon. What, what is the source of this ongoing and powerful affection between the United States and Israel? Oh, uh, goodness, uh, the Bible. <laughs> uh, uh, this is an important place for all the Abrahamic religions. Uh, this very special place. Uh, I'll never forget, Kingman, Kansas. Anybody know where Kingman, Kansas is? Kingman, Kansas, first debate when I was, lost my mind and ran for Congress. Uh, Saturday afternoon, Kingman High School Library, six questions from the audience. Three of them were from evangelical Christians about the nation of Israel. They, 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 understood, uh, they, they understood the deep, significant importance of the Christian faith and that place, that special place, Jerusalem, and the importance 
uh, that it places on the relationship between Christians and Jews all across the world, but certainly there as well. So uh, I, you know, it's hard to explain things that you just know in your heart, uh, but make no mistake about it, uh, the, 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 the Zionist project is important not only to the Jewish people, uh, but to Christian people as well. Luma, Jim, Mr. Secretary, thank you not only for the great conversation, but seriously for all you do for America. Thank you. Thank you.